Welcome to our Compose Cast, where we discuss productivity, self-hosting, career professionalism, and innovative technology. Here to bring you the latest from the open source ecosystem and beyond is yours truly, Andrew Syriac, and with me is my co-host, Jack Moore. How you doing today, Jack? I'm doing well. I can say I'm doing a lot better than a lot of these GitLab servers out here. How about that? <laughs> How are you doing over there? Yeah, no, everything's everything's uh not DDoSing other things right now. So I think I'm I'm pretty good as we saw uh in the b- between last episode and now. Um the the title of our first article here is that GitLab servers are being exploited in DDoS attacks in excess of 1 terabit per second. And I thought this was a very interesting way to bring up the difference between an open source software project uh, and the company in charge of hosting that project. Uh, Because right here is is a perfect example, like GitLab. GitLab is both a product in, in the sense that it is a software GitLab that is, you know, the version control system and and the CICD pipeline and everything around that. Uh, but it's also GitLab.com, which is the company behind that project who runs that project and uh, hosts the various uh, offerings that that they provide. Right. So so anyone can go out there and run their own GitLab server. Uh, but GitLab.com is where they provide hosting for you were you to want to take advantage of that. So we've gone through the have a nebulous pricing scheme but the 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 service there is is available to be taken advantage of Uh, so with that understanding in mind there was a a cve that came out uh, that gitlab patched in their code base in april 2021 Uh, and in the article they go in and describe really what that that attack surface is, but that's not important to the point I'm making here, right? The point I'm making here uh, is found in the third section here where they say about 30,000 GitLab servers remain unpatched. Now, that that instantly conjures up, how can this one company leave so many servers unpatched? And it's like, whoa, 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 whoa slow down. <laughs> this is a GitLab.com that's unpatched. These are all the GitLab servers out there that individuals host that remain unpatched. Yeah, I was going to say the CE and at the Community Edition and Enterprise Edition. You had me confused where, we were, where, we, where you were taking me there with that one. And then you clarified it with, no, 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 it's not GitLab.com's instance. It's everyone else's server, basically. Yeah, and, and all these other servers that are out there somewhere on the internet where this, this scan had been run, uh, they are uh, all unpatched. So all those unpatched servers are uh, have not been updated for that push, uh, fix that was pushed out in April, uh, and uh, there's there's other ways to prevent this, of course, and and I think that's the beauty of open source software is like if you're running behind a reverse proxy, just like don't allow right. the uploading of specific files, you know, at, at that that proxy level, um, or patch your server, right? Uh, so and honestly, this is this is what I'm talking about though, in that you know, our compose. The company, not the product, uh, well, Compositional Enterprise, the company, can provide a hosting solution wherein the upgrades are taken care of, right? right. You're not running the server. And, and, and I look at a lot of DigitalOcean droplets, you know, their, their pre-baked application. Linode has the same thing. Uh, AWS, uh, Google Cloud, they all have these services where they're like, hey, we're going to deploy a stack for you. You know, it's a, it's a full, you know, database uh, middleware, you know, front end kind of stack for you on a server. We'll, we'll deploy that one click. Not a problem. There is no mention in there of updates or upgrades or patches or, or anything like that, right? You're, you're kind of stuck with that version and you better know how to take care of it. You better know how to upgrade it or you better be really good at migrating data over to a brand new instance using a redeploy in like a floating IP or some of the other tricks that you can use. But still at, at that point, right, you've gone from, oh, it's a one click app to I have to build up all of this stuff around it. Infrastructure right around it. Yeah. And and that's where I live. Honestly, that is that is where I love to kind of tinker around. Uh, and, and that's, I think, where my strengths lie. So if if yours don't, right, that's where, you know, Compositional Enterprises, the company, can offer R-Compose the product. And 
and and do that maintenance, do that those upgrades, do the backups. You know, make sure you have a a, a good defensive security posture um, while you're out on the internet because that's a very scary place to be. I think speaking of scary here, I added this show note in at the last minute here. Google, we we continue to speak on these services being so resilient. We speak on how their uptime is crazy. Well, let me tell you the Google. The Google Cloud um, SLA of their five nines or whatever they whatever their SLA is they provide for their customers, I don't think it's going to be met this year. Unfortunately, <laughs> uh, it looked like there was a networking change with some of the load balancers causing a slew of services to go down, and it just goes to show just because they're out there and they're that massive like that, it doesn't mean it does not prevent you from. If you stand your servers up on it, it doesn't prevent you from running into an issue on their end, right? You're kind of at the mercy of them almost. So kind of an interesting one. We'll see what happens. It still looked like as of this evening, uh, I checked this morning and it was offline. Uh, they were having one of their services was just in a critical state. I checked this evening again and it looked like some of those same services were still in a critical state and uh, fewer at like a reduced incident pay, incident status with uh, like some mitigation available but like any uh, i'm sure yeah like any good uh it uh personnel i immediately hopped on reddit to figure out what was going on and i i came across a thread and someone's like well maybe they should change all their branches back f- to master from main which they had um recently renamed i'm like you know what there may be automated tests who knows right that are hard coded with the uh, head branch being being master as it has been for the past you know 20 odd years so uh, based on uh, based on Nothing but sheer conjecture, uh, I would say that. You know, make that change. You know, look at your change management. All right, what was the last thing? What was the last major change that occurred? And and see how that could uh, contribute to the to the issue here. So just just following good IT practices myself. I and I think we'll get into some more composed developments around uh, master here. I don't know if this week, if not next episode. So, uh, yeah, I think I think I want to dive into 4.0 next episode because we I, I do also want to speak on the, the technical uh, implementation uh, of the namesake of this podcast. So so dollar bar itself uh, before we get into the actual integration discussion. Uh, but prior to all of that, uh, I did have one more article that I thought was uh, interesting. You know, more more of the soft skills. You know, as we continue to to bring more of this to the table, to keep this keep this as a, in the front of our minds. You know, as as we the the more techie people are are bound to drift off into the the more interesting aspects. The you know the the technical aspects of this. Uh, there was an article recently published by Laura Hogan. Uh, discussing about how you can be directive without being a jerk. Uh, if you remember back to our, oh man, what, what episode was it? We were talking about the different types of managers and how in an emergency situation, yeah. you know, you would want to be someone who could be decisive, right? And make decisions and, and provide a, uh, a, a, a vision and, and goals and, and that type of leadership for a team, right? Uh, and, and all the downsides that came along with that, you know, it only worked for a very short period of time in a specific circumstance, right? But, but given those, how do you do it well? Uh, and and I thought this this kind of touched on a couple of points uh, that we had discussed previously. So I, w- I want to make sure that we're looping back and keeping those fresh in our minds, uh, as well as uh, some really good framing here. So I'm going to read a couple excerpts from the article and we'll discuss here. Uh, so to start off, the first quote I pulled was, when your team faces any hurdle or stuck moment, you'll need to decide how to jump in. You might choose to adopt an empowering approach, viewing your role more as a facilitator and support structure as the team plots the path forward. But there will still likely be moments where you need to be directive, making decisions and tackling aspects of the work yourself. Don't worry, we can still approach this in a way that drives buy-in and helps your teammates feel heard and know they have autonomy. 
Now that that last word is a big red flag to me. Not red flag, but you know, it's a it's a it's a keyword for me, right? Indicator, I see, right? I see econ- uh, autonomy, and I think, okay, this is this is a good point of view to approach the situation uh, with because we, we, we want to make sure that people feel heard and that they have buy-in. That's the only way you're going to get a team moving in the same direction is if at least they have some kind of consideration. I know we talked about in the scrum band episode, right? You need to have the stakeholders uh, feel that they were at least heard, you know, if, if not, you know, an integral part of the process itself as it comes to, to fruition. Right. Uh, and, and that kind of drives that autonomy, knowing that they've been involved in the decision making. So even when you're being directive, you still have to take these things into consideration. Right. We, we can still, she says, approach this in a way that drives buy in and helps your teammates feel heard and know they have autonomy. Right. Uh, and then what what does this mean? So like, what are we doing at this point in time? So she says, when we as managers are being directive on a project, we're deciding on the who, what, when, and how. And then we're communicating that information to the rest of the team. Now, to me, this feels a lot like scope, right? When we talk about we're scoping a project, right? We're determining the, the why done how, you know, why are we doing this? What does done look like? And how might we start to approach that? Uh, she narrows in on the role of someone, you know, and 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 namely their role in the product. <clears throat> so, or, or or project, right? D- depending. So she's talking about if your role is defined uh, with how you're going to do your work, right? You are obliged to follow that uh, in an inflexible type manner, right? You can't iterate over time um, and your role success criteria remains, uh, well, your your role success criteria is simply the how you do it, right? And I think we've, we've broken this up, you know, trying to map her thought process on how we do it, right? We map this out as in, let's define the, the done state, right? What is What is the thing we're trying to get done? You know, what is the outcome? You know, what is, what is the, what does it need to happen in order for this to be considered done? Uh, And then we also had the why at the end, or excuse me, the how we have the how at the end. We say, how can this get done? We define how this can be done. And and I say can be done, right? Because this is something that's going to be flexible. This is something that's going to change over time as we get more into the weeds uh, on a specific task. We're going to, we're going to determine, you know, how how can we best approach this? Is our first approach uh, the best way or, or do we need to iterate over that while still remaining uh, the same when it comes to the, the role success criteria here or, like I say, the definition of done? The one thing I really liked from this article on that portion basically is defining – when you define scope, right, you have to define – what your role is in that in the scope of that task essentially you say fine you you get all the key players together and you say all right what's our definition of done this but then i really like she kind of had this little tangent in there uh you might have noticed that i tried to avoid the word accountable when i'm listing responsibilities and she goes on to say i found accountable can mean many different things to many different people uh and then she has in quotes here we'll get fired if this doesn't happen (laughs) It's the communications person or liaison is doing the work directly. So that person's accountable for it. Glad we can do the air quotes now on the podcast. Um, But I really like the prescription that she kind of had, which was the recommendation to describe what you actually mean when you say accountable, because I know we've said we brought up accountability quite a bit, but it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And that's the one thing I kind of take out of that scope too it's all right you're accountable for this but what does that mean yeah and when you're accountable and for especially task? in a larger project too when you're breaking up specific tasks what you're able to do is saying all right well here's here's the done condition for this task you, you don't have to accomplish the entire thing right your role in this big project for right now is this one deliverable just this. right just this right you don't have to solve the entire problem like when I was working on 4.0, and of course I'm going to talk on it because why not, right? How could Fresh. I how could I get through this without you know disclosing? But anyways, in in this I I, I ran into an issue with Portal, 
And I was like, here's the question. Do I fix portal? Right. Or do I work around the limitations that's there? Right. Because there's, there's also limitations coming in from other externalities that aren't going to be addressed. Right. So I don't necessarily, it's not blocking to this. It's not going to affect my ability to meet my done condition. Right. Do I address this or not? And if it's not in my done condition, then no, that's outside of my scope. And then that should be for a, a separate task. Right. And that's a, right. that's a very concrete way to approach a very difficult, nuanced problem. And I do bring up the fact that it is a larger project because that's, that's really what this, this post is, is written uh, to here. It's, it's, it's a larger projects that aren't a particular task. And, and I know we haven't really talked about that because usually our, our, our Q4 meetings, you know, our road, road uh, map meetings are, are, uh, just between the two of us and we're deciding on, you know, what, what to prioritize, what, what not to. Uh, and then we have those projects that we review periodically, but usually you and I are focused on specific tasks that need to get implemented. Right. And, and, and tracking those through their life cycle. Uh, what she's talking about here is a, a, a bigger type of project. Right. And, and talking about um, how to get a team through that particular project project right um i i do like here she picks up from where you left off on the discussion about the crocodile brain and and uh kind of your your gut reaction there uh the fight or flight response um and 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 the rest of those you know cliches uh she she talks about it in the terms of amygdala hijacking which i thought was very interesting right where you get that you get that quick reaction to something right you get that you get that uh that muscle memory reaction to something and and how do you start to dissuade that right um and and i think she has three really good points here and 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 these are these are at the level of you know dale carnegie uh if if you want to calm anyone down, just tell them, hey, I totally understand where you're coming from. And if I was in the same position as you, I undoubtedly would be thinking the same thing, right? That immediately disarms anyone. I think these questions are kind of in that vein uh, where she's she's talking about we're, we're, we're not optimizing, you know, for avoiding grumpiness, right? But we do want to understand where people are coming from. And her three questions are these, you know, what feels most important? to you about this that really gets deep into the heart of the matter that bypasses, you know, what's, what's your gut check about this? No. What is, what feels most important to you about this? Really dig deep and, you know, uh, do this, um, you know, and, and, and what is your, what is your gut telling you? Because as your elephant leans, right, you don't want your li- your, your rider, and I'm going to go back to that analogy, as your, as your elephant leans, you don't want your rider to, become a PR person, right? You don't want them to, to say, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to make something up as I go along and hopefully it's going to re- reflect reality at some point, right? You got to, you got to take a step, take a breather, right? Take, take five minutes and say, all right, what's, what's going on, right? You obviously feel some sort of way about this. Let's spend time to figure out why you feel that kind of way. Um, and, and another one, a really good leading question that could either lead into, discussion like a larger discussion or a more specific discussion right it could be a lot of surface type issues or it could be one really deep issue um and and that's going to be uncovered by asking what one thing do you wish you could change about this um and and that could lead into you know it, it any kind of tangent but i think that's going to be a tangent that people are going to follow their mind about and they're going to say hey um, let me bring up what's actually on my mind. And, and, and really that's what you're trying to do with all the three of these questions. You're trying to get, you know, people to be upfront and honest and, and, and get a good reading out of them. Um, so if those three questions I think are, are one of my key takeaways and saying that those, those were really well put together. Uh, she says, you know, it goes on, why are we using these questions? She says, by using a coaching type of approach, uh, you're actually operating from the empowerment end of the spectrum, right? Which we know is the long-term success. You know, it's, it's not the short emergency way to, to attack things. If, if you're able to slow down for 20 minutes, and I guarantee you, you, ask, you tell someone, hey, 
I'll get to this in 20 minutes, right? There, there will be the same kind of responses. I will get to this right now. You, you can take 20 minutes. Yeah. You can sit back and take 20 minutes because this is important, right? So uh, operating from the empowerment end of the spectrum is important. Uh, she says, in a lot of directive settings, you will still have an opportunity to leverage empowering skills to help others feel seen and heard and to help them grow. That's why it's important to continue adapting your approach as the context evolves, right? As soon as you know that you can take those 20 minutes that you're not in a a, a every second counts type of situation, as, as soon as you're like... It would be better to have buy-in for the long term over this. You can step back and, and start taking that that empowerment approach. Uh, and she, she even goes on and talking about what she sees as the bigger win. Uh, she says, asking these open questions and reflecting on what you heard them say will make your teammate feel heard and seen, which speaks which speeds up their ability to recover from their amygdala hijack. They can they can recover from thinking from with that crocodile brain and they can start having totally. a real true conversation with you, which is what you need. You need you need people to be open, honest and truthful. And 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 that's the kind of culture you're trying to cultivate with this this approach. I agree. I I like the article. I'll tell you what I took away two. Uh, there were two main points I, t- I, w- I took away from it specifically myself. Uh, and those two were basically, as you kind of touched on them there, uh, identification, right? And I like how you put it into the word scope. I didn't even think of that. I just said, I just, you know, asked myself the questions, what needs to get done? Who's doing it? Why is it being done? You know, how is it getting done? Fine. Right. And then the second part I took away was how is it being communicated? How are you communicating this to either direct reports or to the business or the project how how are you communicating it to again essentially all the stakeholders and those are i didn't boil it down all the way to the sub levels but those are the two things that i mainly took away from this article that i really liked and i thought she did a very i thought she did a great job writing it yeah it was it was a a beast of an article she she really covered a a, a plethora of things here uh so yeah props props on on that article i'm interested to see if i run across any more of this yeah i did i thought you linked uh one more in there from her i didn't get a chance to look at that one but i saw one was linked in the show notes oh that was the uh the article that she had written about the classic signs of amygdala hijacking uh so she goes in and says you know what uh what to do when your employees are in crisis mode Right. Uh, and, and she says, you know, what does this look like? You know, what what are some red flags when you say, oh, someone is panicking right now? You know, uh, so she says folks in flight or fight mode will commonly display one of these five forms of resistance, uh, questioning or doubting, uh, avoiding, fighting, bonding or escaping. Uh, and then she links to her article on Forbes where she does that write up. And that's definitely one worth checking out. I'm going to have to take a look at it after this uh, episode here. Yeah, but I think we can move on to uh, the one article that you found this week uh, in our community. I'll tell you what, it was a light week this week. Usually I feel like Rundeck is kind of running in sync with a podcast here with a release every uh, podcast episode or at least the day before. No updates from them, so I don't know what's going on. Maybe they're f- coming up with a new name uh, for the next release. <laughs> but um, the one news article we did have was even, in this case, a small one. Uh, WordPress did get up upgraded here to 5.8.2, and nothing major released. It's two bug fixes and a security fix, so nothing major to report on this. It has been updated, but... Uh, it sounds like 5.9 is right around the corner based on what the blog post said. But that is all I have for community updates. I think we should jump right into our developments. I know we have a f- quite a few coming in the in the pipeline right now and uh, kind of what we've already completed here. Yeah, we are we are definitely full steam ahead. Uh, and, and I think that's that momentum is just uh, continuing to carry us forward here. So so super happy about that uh, to kind of go over what we have uh, been doing um i'm actually going to hit our last one first here which is retiring our instagram account 
Um, I just don't think that's the right place for us to be right now. And I, I, I think we had that discussion and, and uh, we were in agreement about that. Uh, so we're retiring that. We, uh, we have started um, establishing a presence on uh, LinkedIn. Obviously, we're still on Reddit um, and YouTube as well. So uh, thinking about other sites right now, nothing is confirmed. But there, we're, we're not a content creation, uh, you know shop here despite what it may seem like uh, we actually do put a lot of work into what we do that being said my next item is is about a blog that we're putting out um and and i just i just threw the title here how to pass raw tags to a jekyll post which you've obviously learned how to do given our second post Learned that one the hard way yes <laughs> Yes. Um, so when you had done the the write up about uh, cloud in it, and uh, or or was that no, that was the first one. The you it had, was the first one. It was about developing an on. If you're interested in developing, essentially, I wrote this mm. neat little article on uh, how you can contribute or how if you want to add a service of your own to add it. You know, you can clone down our project and our uh, collection here. Uh, out on GitLab, and you can spin up your own instance, and you can run Ansible against it, and you can spin up whatever services you like with the tasks. Well, I go to write this write up. Sure enough, I merge it into master, thinking, yeah, everything's looking great. Did not test it. It being Je a Jekyll blog, thinking, oh, this is going to work fine. Which uses against which uses uh, li uh, um, liquid. Uh, templates liquid. yeah I'm yeah yeah ginger yep. ginger liquid templates which ansible also uses ginger templating which means when you're putting in code that has variables in it and jekyll's trying to interpret the post itself as a post and sees a variable that it recognizes it says i'm going to try to interpret that variable yep unfortunately so luckily for us i think jekyll's the last service to be built if I'm understanding that correctly. Uh, so <laughs> luckily all of our systems stayed online. Everything we were able to run a composition, we were able to get a fix in, add in some raw tags basically. So uh, the liquid wasn't parsing it as actual code and we were able to get that fix. With that being said, we do have another post out as well on cloud in it. And if you go and look, I believe I kept in the raw tags. I think it's just going to be something I do now from now on on those code snippets, because if I don't do it on some and do it on others, I'm just going to get in the tendency to not do it because I'm not used to it. Um, but we do have another great write up out on the Compositional Enterprises blog, which we will add a link to in the show notes here. And we will continue to add posts I will say they come out usually the week after the podcast is online. So yep. that's out there. Another resource. Uh, and then the last development here is our our inclusion of, of dollar bar uh, into our services. So this is this is the latest service. Uh, and this is been recently added uh right now it's sitting as of one week ago uh most of the testing had been done i think about two weeks ago but the the takeaway here is that uh dollar bar uh being an erp which is an enterprise resource platform um has planning planning and a source yeah and yeah. an enterprise resource planning uh, software has been included here. Uh, and, and this goes actually hand in hand, uh, Jack, with your first write up on the blog, where this is a very, very simple service that got added. Uh, you know, we put in all the necessary variables. It follows kind of the standard template of setting up the database, uh, spinning up the Docker container, uh, you know, creating the bind mount points and establishing the, the administrator. Uh, and 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 then as well setting the nginx config. Uh, so if you're looking for a really good example of what Jack was talking about when when he's like, uh, you know, what does it take to add a service? Uh, this is this is a really prime example of that because it's as straightforward as you can get. Yeah, and with the I might have to with 4.0 coming right around the corner here. I know we keep mentioning it. 
we're not going to talk on it uh, this episode, but the next one, give you something to look forward to here. Uh, we will discuss it. Uh, coming down the pipeline, I'm sure I will have a technical post up on adding a service with our 4.0 release. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's not much different uh, other than it's completely different. So as, lo- as long as you convey that to the audience, we'll be fine. <laughs> so go for it. Go for it. <laughs>